So as you have probably heard, the past couple of weeks have seen absolutely enormous demonstrations taking place in Hong Kong. Uh, one of which was reportedly about 2 million people, another 1 million people. Uh, and the population of Hong Kong is only 7 million, so it means about a quarter of the population has been out demonstrating. But what are these demonstrations about? What attitude do Marxists take towards them? And what kind of, uh, where, should the, 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 where should the demonstrations go? What demands should they take up and what methods do we think that they should use? So the immediate cause of the demonstrations is the extradition law, which uh, is being proposed by the Hong Kong government, um, and it gives the Hong Kong government the right to extradite to China anybody from any nationality that China considers to be a criminal. And what the Hong Kong government claims is that this should be uncontroversial because it's purely a criminal matter. And they say that, you know, Hong Kong has become something of a haven for criminals and uh, that these people need to be uh, tried properly uh, in mainland China. Uh, everyone knows in reality that this is, uh, this is a, a tool which will enable the, the Beijing government, basically, uh, which dominates the Hong Kong government, uh, to um, have a legal covering for what it is already doing, because the, the, the Beijing government already abducts people in Hong Kong uh, that it wants to, basically. And it has most famously done so with a group of booksellers uh, who were publishing books in Hong Kong that were kind of of a gossipy character about the, um, about the, the leaders of the Chinese government. Uh, these people were abducted and then later on turned up in mainland China. And given that they do this already without any legal covering, this legal covering will clearly make it only the more easy and also China has a history of, as do many other authoritarian regimes, has a history of, of, of trying political dissidents, people that disagree with or campaign against the regime, trying them on basically trumped up criminal charges such as of drug smuggling, which everyone knows is not the real reason that they're being tried. So it's not fooling anyone, everybody knows uh, what this represents. And this is a real threat for Hong Kongers because um, it means essentially that they would be under the, potentially under the regime, uh, the, you know, the, the authoritarian regime of mainland China, which they are not used to at all. So this means that any Facebook post, you know, that gets a lot of likes, that criticizes the Chinese regime, even something like that potentially, and certainly they fear that it could be, uh, could lead to them, you know, being in jail in mainland China. Uh, so this is something that is terrifying for people from Hong Kong. And also Hong Kong is something of a political haven for different kind of um, dissidents from China. Most notably perhaps is the case of Han Dongfang, who runs the China Labour Bulletin, which is a very good website which reports on... Uh, he is from mainland China, in fact he's one of the leaders of the workers uh, in the Tiananmen Square protests, and he had to flee. And now he is in Hong Kong and he runs this website, which is able to report on uh, strikes and demonstrations by workers in the mainland which wouldn't otherwise be reported on and he gives help and support to them um, and so people like him potentially could suddenly you know basically Hong Kong would cease to play that role would cease to be a, be a place from which Chinese people could criticize their government could organize solidarity etc so it represents a, a very grave threat and in general Hong Kongers feel increasingly less Chinese with each passing year um, most of them are not, if you like, proud to be Chinese, according to opinion polls. Um, and this is because they are feeling more and more pressure from the Beijing regime. Supposedly, uh, that, you know, there's an agreement from the handover from the British in 1997, known as um, One Country, Two Systems. In other words, Hong Kong is technically part of China, you know, falls under its defence you know, arrangements, etc. But um, its own legal system uh, would, was to retain the character that it had under the British, basically more of a sort of bourgeois democratic legal system where protests are allowed, for example. It was to retain that for 50 years uh, up until 2047. But increasingly, uh, Hong Kongers are getting terrified of that slipping away and, and already being chipped away at bit by bit by the pressure from Beijing. Um, and so this is actually only the latest in a long line of very large protests against the Chinese regime. But I would argue that these are the biggest and most militant that we've seen yet. Um, 
What is also very notable about the demonstrations is the, not just their size, but the militancy of how they're carried out and the left-wing character of some of the demands and the leaders um, uh, in the demonstrations. So, for example, um, the demonstrations have also attempted to storm the Legislative Council, which is basically the Parliament, um, which is a very militant act to take. They've attempted to storm it and to occupy it. Um, they've also called for the resignation of Carrie Lam, who is the, um, basically the leader of Hong Kong, um, which is a very bold step to take. Um, and uh, they've obviously called for the complete removal of the extradition law. And more recently, in the last few days, they've essentially sieged the police headquarters, as well as marching to various um, uh, embassies from other countries. So they've been taking quite militant actions, and some of the demands that have been floated in the movement necessar haven't necessarily become the main demands, um, uh, but nevertheless very widespread demands were for a general strike, um, which indicates an increasingly class-conscious character to the demonstrations. Um, and that may come as a surprise because Hong Kong has a reputation as, you know, sort of ultra-capitalist place, you know, a sort of a finance, city, a finance city in which there is little else but finance and uh, in which perhaps in the public imagination of the rest of the world it's a very rich place, um, very bi basically a business orientated place. That's how it is perceived, certainly from the outside, but it's not really true. It has a large working class and a working class whose conditions despite the very, very high GDP per capita of Hong Kong, the conditions of the Hong Kong working class are quite poor. Um, and Hong Kong's role as a financial hub and a sort of gateway to the world for Chinese capitalism, which of course in recent years is becoming an increasingly powerful uh, uh, form of capitalism, an increasingly you know, dominant figure in world trade. Hong Kong therefore has become this kind of pinch point, if you like, like a kind of bottleneck where, you know, it's a very small area, um, just basically an island and a little bit of the mainland. Um, but concentrated in that tiny amount of space is a vast amount of financial transactions. Um, and this is obviously becomes like a magnet for investment from all over the world and from mainland China. Um, and with people sort of descending into the city in huge quantities from the mainland and from other parts of the world, who, you know, people who want to trade with China, this has driven up property prices to an extraordinary extent. Um, I was just reading that f half of all flats in Hong Kong now are, the rent of them is about two and a half thousand US dollars a month, which is about 70% of the average income uh, of, a Hong, of a Hong Konger. So the conditions of the, you know, the, the, the way that Hong Kong working class people live is in tiny, tiny studio flats, cockroach infested, you know, in very bad uh, state of um, repair in many cases, and exorbitantly expensive for a tiny amount of space. Um, and of course, perhaps in the past to a certain extent, um, Hong Kongers who were hostile to China may have had a sort of anti-communist um, mentality and perhaps a pro-Western mentality. Um, but nowadays, because China is so explicitly capitalist, and it is that very capitalism of China that is making Hong Kong so expensive and difficult to live in, actually increasingly, especially with the young people of Hong Kong, this anti-China mood is also an anti-capitalist mood to a certain extent. And this is expressed in a new three-year-old political party called Demazisto. Uh, that was formed out of the Umbrella Movement, which was a, uh, a similar protest wave uh, from about four or five years ago that took place. I would argue perhaps slightly even less uh, militant and significant than this one, but still very large. And uh, it was largely a youth movement and several of its prominent leaders were elected to the Legislative Council and they, they were then kicked out of it because they refused to say the oath of allegiance to China or to say it in a respectful manner. Uh, and they've become something of pop popular heroes, especially for young people. And um, they formed this party. And this party says in its programme that it is an anti-capitalist party that fights against the, the capitalist hegemony of the Chinese regime. Now, in my opinion, that is, they have distanced themselves from that, uh, that, that sort of socialistic position and um, they have a very vague programme, I would say. However, it's nevertheless extremely telling that they even wrote this in their party programme. They've also raised the demand for a general strike. 
although I would say they've done so in an inconsistent manner. Sometimes late at night saying we're going to have a general strike tomorrow and then suddenly the next morning retracting that. So it's not been a particularly consistent uh, leadership and I think that the, the leadership of it is actually far more hesitant and less bold than that of the millions of demonstrators themselves, the rank and file. But I think it's very telling nevertheless that it's moved in this direction, that of general strikes and, 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 and attacking capitalism even if somewhat vaguely. Um, so yes, there is a very very militant mood in Hong Kong and I think the significance of this as well is it's not a passing mood. You know, it's not something like the, the big protests we had in Britain around the Iraq war, which of course were hugely significant, but that was kind of a one-off event, lasted for a time, obviously. But this is a kind of an existential crisis for Hong Kong, you know, because for the, the, it's quite clear that the direction of travel for Hong Kong is increasing um, subordination to, to mainland China or to the Beijing regime, to the point where it just becomes like any other part of... Um, of China. Um, and that means a loss of, of democratic rights, essentially. Um, and again, for the reasons I've spelled out, it means increasingly high living standards, given that this becomes this kind of financial hub for the whole of China. So that's the future of Hong Kong, as it stands. That's clearly what the plans are for Hong Kong. And that is something that um, the mass of Hong Kong people are desperate to fight against. Um, but China, on the other hand, feels the need to continue to pressure Hong Kong and to, to make it under, to, to, to dominate it, basically. Because China is becoming, um, first of all, as we know, China is an authoritarian regime, and in general, it doesn't tolerate dissent. And Hong Kong has become a haven for dissent. But also, as China grows and comes into struggle with America, as we can see all the time now with the, with the trade war, uh, China fears uh, uh, turbulence, if you like, instability of any kind, be it economic or political. And it's terrified of its, of its own working class. Um, it's terrified of you know, any instance of, of, of workers' demonstrations and protests breaking out, and especially of them linking up in any way. You know, it's terrified of any organisation which is capable. It doesn't necessarily mind so much a one-off strike, but what it's terrified of is, is, a, is a demonstration that sort of gathers steam and, and, and particularly of an organisation that can knit it together and preserve that, you know, and become a point of reference. That is what it is absolutely terrified of. And Hong Kong is, as I said, it, it is a haven for anyone who wants to build such an organisation. Um, and of course, as China con conflicts with America, it fears not only future economic crises, perhaps just from its own economic problems or from the trade war, but it also fears America intervening in its affairs. And it feels basically that Hong Kong is a point of weakness within its own shores. It's this, this anomalous place where people can say and do as they like from its point of view. And that is intolerable for it, for this regime which fears any criticism of itself. Um, and it's that is also revealed in other things such as the enormous ramping up of both military spending but also internal security spending which they actually spend even more on than they do on external military spending. So clearly the regime is very worried and I think this is part of that. And that means it's a problem that's just not going to go away. It is not just one law that happens to have rather ineptly been proposed. It's something that is going to come back and back again in slightly different forms, but it's going to continually become under pressure from, from Beijing. But the population is arguably only going to get more and more hostile to Beijing with each such attempt. So it's a, a, a real flashpoint, um, and I think it will continue to be so for some time. Um, in terms of the movement itself and, 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 and the demands that we think the movement should take up and, and where we think it will go, um, I think the movement is kind of, as all movements usually are, uh, is divided between a, a radical, more left-wing and militant side and a more conservative side. And the more conservative side has been on display in recent days. For example, um, at recent demonstrations, they have uh, taken out advertisements, they've crowdfunded advertisements uh, calling essentially for foreign intervention into Hong Kong um, and they've been marching to embassies um, especially in the run-up to the G20 summit uh, in Tokyo I think. Um, so they, they've basically been saying you know 
to the Western world, you know, listen to our plight. Won't you do something about us? Won't you put pressure on, on Beijing? And some have even been calling for actual intervention, direct intervention from the United States and from Britain to, to come and rescue them. So that's it, the conservative uh, side, essentially, that wants to be like the West, which has no real criticisms of capitalism uh, and sees China as the enemy, China as just bad, and is often, fr is frequently very anti-mainlander. You know, very they and you know attack and blames ordinary working class mainlanders also for their problems. Uh, but on the other hand, you have a very radical left wing. I already mentioned Demosisto, which also is explicitly opposed to any anti mainlander prejudice. Uh, it, st it states that quite clearly. You've got the demand for a general strike, which has been taken up, although it hasn't actually been carried out, but is becoming very popular. And the main demand at the moment is for the resignation of Carrie Lam, um, not just for the removal of the extradition law, but for the, for, the, um, for the resignation of Carrie Lam, which would be a, a huge loss of face for Beijing. It would be an absolutely enormous thing. According to recent uh, leaked um, notes from a meeting that she has had, she not only does not intend to stand down, but actually hasn't yet re removed the extradition law, though she has, under the pressure demonstration, shelved it temporarily, but she has said that actually she's going to bring it back in a year or two. Uh, and again, that reflects the ongoing crisis that this whole situation represents, as I've, as I've discussed. Anyway, so there is a, an increasingly left-wing side to the, to the movement, and an increasingly militant one. What I would say is it needs to take up the demand for a general strike. Um, you know, the Chinese regime is not going to back down, it might back down temporarily, but in the long run, it is absolutely not going to back down on its plan to incorporate Hong Kong in, uh, into mainland China. So very militant methods need to be taken up. And a, and a general strike uh, in a key economic place such as Hong Kong can be very powerful. Uh, but as well as that, it's something that can also resonate with workers in the mainland, which are the natural allies of this movement. And that is what the movement should, should be appealing to internationally, is not to the governments of, of, of Washington and of London, but is to the ordinary working class people, most immediately those in the rest of the Pearl River Delta. That is places like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, you know, the other major cities uh, just over, you know, over the border, uh, the major sort of economic hubs that you have in China with enormous working class populations there they should be appealing to these exploited workers who also have you know an, a lot of grievances against the Beijing regime and also of course against capitalists that those are their natural allies and if they launched a general strike and actually appealed for solidarity strikes from the mainland if those took off that would absolutely change the game and that would represent an enormous crisis for Beijing and who knows where that would would lead what that would lead to Another demand I think they need to take up is not just for the resignation of Carrie Lam, but actually for the fundamental change to the whole of the constitution of Hong Kong. Hong Kong does not, not have a democratic constitution. The constitution of Hong Kong is um, basically one in which uh, business interests and different sort of special interests essentially get a certain amount of votes um, for the leadership of, 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 of Hong Kong. Uh, there's no real, you know, su universal suffrage at all. So the demand should be obviously for universal suffrage, but a complete transformation, I think, uh, of the constitution into a de democratic one. And further still, that this enormous protest movement should actually elect um, leaders, you know, and should form committees throughout Hong Kong and in the workplaces of Hong Kong to organise the general strike, which I discussed, but also actually to, to, to be the, the basis of, of a new um, a, and a genuinely democratic representation of the Hong Kong people. They need to go in that direction to, to, to form their own leadership. Uh, at the moment, there isn't a, a serious leadership uh, to, to these movements. It's very kind of vague and up in the air who is really leading it and who they are responsible for it to, etc. So that is the direction the movement needs to go in. And ultimately, it's not just an anti-Chinese, it's not just an anti-Beijing movement, it has to be an anti-capitalist movement. The main problem for Hong Kong is not that the, the Beijing regime is authoritarian, but that the Beijing regime is a very powerful capitalist regime, which is using Hong Kong to further its own capitalist interests. And that is what is making living standards so bad in, in Hong Kong. That's also why Hong Kongers need to have their democratic rights, so that they can strike you know, for better living standards, you know, and uh, to change, you know, the democratic situation in, in Hong Kong so that they can, 
build more so ca council housing, social housing, for example. So it's, it's not just a purely democratic question, it's a social question. Uh, and the crisis of, of society, if, if you like, uh, that you have in Hong Kong because it is because of capitalism. So I think that they, they need to, to take up socialist demands and that would also resonate with the working class in mainland Hong Kong. Uh, at the moment, um, I think the, the movement is at a bit of a watershed. It's not sure where to go at the moment. Um, there are more protests and more protests being called, but the demands are somewhat vague. So we'll have to see how it develops. It may subside for a time, but as I said, for, for the reasons I've described, it's a movement which will only continue, maybe with this or that ebb, but in the long run, it is a movement which will continue and will grow in radicalization in the coming years. So I think all socialists should pay very close attention to what is taking place in Hong Kong.